Welcome to the SMU Video Archive Series. In this series, we interview members of the SMU community who can provide insight into the history of SMU, especially from the perspective of their time at the university. I'm Jim Early. We have with us today Bill Stalkup, who's Professor Emeritus of Biology, also former provost and president ad interim. We're deeply appreciative of you, Bill, to come here and share your information with us. Thank you, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here. And <clears throat> I feel very privileged to uh, have you as a former colleague and good friend uh, during the interview. Well, Bill, I, I, I'd be interested in getting a sense of your initial impression of SMU when you, what, what was the year you were enrolled? Uh, <clears throat> well, the year I enrolled was uh, 1937, although um, for the two years before that, I was a high school student, Forest Avenue High School, in ROTC. And ROTC cadets at that time were used to uh, usher at football games. So I, I spent many a Saturday afternoon at, uh, at Owenby uh, Stadium. Uh, that, that was uh, my first, uh, really, uh, connection with SMU. Uh, when, when I graduated high school, we really didn't have uh, college counselors. And as a matter of fact, uh, we were a relatively poor uh, family, and I had assumed that I would go to work after graduation and, and, and help out with the family. Uh, at a reception following graduation, uh, the principal, Wiley A. Parker, asked me what I was going to do. <clears throat> and I said, well, I guess I'm going to have to get a job and go to work. He said, had you ever thought about going to college? And I said, oh, yes. Uh, he said, well, uh, if I got you a scholarship at SMU, would you, uh, would you be able to go? And I said, well, I'll certainly talk with my father uh, about it. And uh, I was given uh, what was then called an emergency scholarship, which paid full tuition, which at that time, as I recall, was $125 a semester. <clears throat> and uh, I, I, Dad was able to provide me with a little money to uh, buy books, and I think probably uh, books for a semester then cost $25. Uh, so that's how I, I came to, uh, to yeah. SMU. Well, I, I'm so used to SMU after the great post-war building boom with the uh, Fondren Science and so on. Right. Well, what was the... Uh, situation with the sciences in terms of where they were and how they operated when you first came? Well, the, uh, let's see, biology, uh, geology, and physics are located in Higher Hall. Uh, biology occupied the third floor with geology on the second and physics on the, on, on the first floor. Um, and uh, uh, the facilities were quite meager. We had a a lecture room which was adequate. The uh, laboratories were not great, but once again were were certainly adequate. And I remember I, I was a I was a January entrant, and I remember that I took both biology one and two during that spring semester. I took English one and two during that first semester, and there was another course, and I don't remember what it was, but. <laughs> Uh, those courses yeah. kept me uh, kept me quite busy. Yeah. Well, at some point, I'd like to get a sense from you of the transition of the biology department facilities, uh, characters on the faculty, and and curriculum. But uh, perhaps we might first start out with a sense of uh, perhaps your sense of student life here and. Uh, you were a commuting student? I was a commuting student. I commuted from South Dallas. I would uh, get on a streetcar mm -hmm. in South Dallas and uh, transfer downtown mm -hmm. and ride the, ride the streetcar on out here. There were, I believe, at the time I entered SMU, 1,800 or 2,000 mm -hmm. students. students. The uh, Department of Biology had, let's see, there was Elmer Cheatham, Main mm -hmm. Lonecker, uh, Sam Geyser, who was chair at that time, and ultimately uh, Joe Harris, mm -hmm. 
Joe was the junior. Man. Joe Joe was the junior junior man there. Yeah, and uh, I was uh, I, I was unable to belong to a fraternity, but there was uh, there were a number of independent students on campus, and there were a lot of activities in which we could uh, participate. I remember playing, for example, on the pre-med. Uh, intramural <laughs> football team. It was touch touch yeah, football yeah. and we played the lawyers and the pre field logs mm -hmm. and so on and and one year and I don't remember which one it was, we even won the championship mm -hmm. that year and were awarded some sweaters uh, as a result of that. Um, when did you start graduate school, Bill? I didn't start graduate school until after the war. A after, after you were after a flyer? After the war, yeah. Or were you a flyer or just a flight crew? What well, no, I was, uh, I was a radar observer, which yeah. was, uh, which yeah. was uh, meant I was a, a, a flyer. Yeah. Not pilot, but a radar yeah. observer, radar countermeasure yeah. person. Um, I had... Uh, if, if we could step back just a minute, I, I'd say that mm -hmm. in my sophomore year at SMU, Elmer Cheatham and, and Maine Lonecker had, a, had an ecological project down on a, a couple of twin lakes down in East mm -hmm. Texas. And uh, they employed me and another fellow student to go down on weekends and uh, take water samples mm -hmm. and do chemical and biological analysis on those. Ecology, and I'm getting back to answering yeah. your question ultimately, ecology was just coming into its own. So your lifelong concern with ecology started out right out as uh, Started out as a pre-med, but yeah. suddenly after doing this work on those lakes in East Texas, I decided that I would rather yeah. uh, do something like mm -hmm. that. And as a matter of fact, uh, when I graduated, I took a civil service examination for the city of Dallas which I think Cheatham and Lonecker had prepared. <laughs> so I not only passed the examination, but I, I got the position of junior aquatic biologist chemist, city of Dallas. Uh, my main focus was on Lake Dallas, which was the chief water supply at that time. Uh, and uh, was uh, just getting started to work there when, of course, the war came along. And I, uh, I volunteered as a uh, communications cadet in what was then the Army mm -hmm. Air Force and uh, went to basic training and then through uh, radio school at Yale University as a matter of fact for four months and then given the choice of well there were four choices uh, one could go to uh, fighters uh -huh. or to bombers or to air transport mm -hmm. command or uh, back to radar school. My first choices were uh, uh, bombers and then air transport command and then fighters so they sent me back to radar school <laughs> and I did get my observers rating there and went overseas as a as a radar countermeasure uh, person uh, I, I uh, left the service and after the war was over in 45 I had already uh, applied to and had been uh, granted admission to Cornell University but I came out to visit my professors here on campus and they were looking forward to a huge uh, GI enrollment in the spring and they said could you stay see your way to staying on for uh, a spring semester to, to help out and I said sure well as a matter of fact I stayed on for five years uh, helping out uh, always with the intention of going to graduate school but I, I do remember toward the end of that five years I was called over to the uh, uh, provost's office, uh, Dr. Hemphill Hosford, who was the provost at that time, and who, along with Elsie Ritchie, who became Elsie Starr, only two people in the provost's office. They ran the whole university. And he looked at me and he said, William, he said, you know, he said, I hear you're doing a fine job over there, but he said, you can never expect any advancement unless you go and get a graduate degree. I said, I've already made those arrangements and I did go to the uh, University of Kansas uh, where uh, uh, I ultimately took my PhD degree and returned to uh, SMU in 1973. Uh, they were kind enough to invite me back and was there from at SMU uh, 
1973 until my retirement in 1989. But SMU was the kind of place in those days where the provost would haul in a junior faculty member and, and give him some good advice. That's exactly right. And he, he was a, uh, uh, Hemphill Hosford was a very dear uh, person and I think uh, made a real contribution to this university. All of this is getting back around to your uh, question as to the evolution of the department itself. I guess about the time I was getting my graduate degree, Watson and Crick were discovering DNA or discovering what it really was like and what it did. And that changed the complete uh, uh, field of, of biology. It suddenly, almost suddenly, became uh, uh, cellular and molecular where, uh, as opposed to more the more classical approaches uh, to biology. And uh, uh, by the time I left the department, the department had gone almost completely to molecular and cellular biology as opposed to ecology and field work and organismic biology and things of that sort. Must have been quite a transformation when you suddenly had a science building as opposed to some rooms in the higher <coughs> hall. Well, uh, the summer before I went in 1950, before I went to graduate school, we moved from Higher Hall to Fondren Science uh, uh, Building. And once again, the faculty at that time had not really increased to any great extent. Was Sam Geiser and Elmer Cheatham, Main Long Anchor, Joe Harris, myself, and Lloyd Shinners, who was the director of the newly formed herbarium at that point in time. Uh, and as a matter of fact, when I came back from graduate school, uh, had essentially the same faculty then and in subsequent years over the next uh, five or ten years we employed two or three more people, John McCarthy, John Ubelocker, uh and one or two others. Well Bill, could I shift you now towards your long and distinguished uh, somewhat checkered administrative <coughs> career. Uh, you and I uh, joined the <laughs> operation when Jim Brooks became the Dean of the School of Humanities and Sciences. We uh, were his associate deans. Uh, was there anything of that period you'd care to recall? I remember very well you're showing up at my office one day and said, what are we going to do? <laughs> Jim had invited us to come into administration for a couple of years in the School of Humanities and Sciences to, uh, to help him out. Uh, I do remember one of the first things that we faced was the matter of women's salaries. Uh, Neil McFarland, who was provost, had found uh, some money to uh, uh, increase uh, women's salaries. And I remember uh, we were approached by two women who said they wanted to computerize all of this and, and uh, come up with some solution as to how we should distribute the money. And when their solution came to us, we were we were completely amazed because it didn't make any sense. <laughs> and I don't remember exactly how we distributed it, Jim, but we, we did get it uh, uh, distributed. And then, of course, uh, uh, Neil McFarlane left the provost's office and Jim was, t was invited to come over as, as provost and uh, asked me if I would come over as associate provost, leaving you as dean of, of faculties, I think, uh, in the School of Humanities and Sciences. So I accompanied, uh, I accompanied uh, Jim over to the provost's office for uh, two or three years uh, uh, to help out uh, uh, then. What and do I, you remember as some of the major pressures and issues? <laughs> I remember uh, I, I was then, uh, uh, in that year 74, I was involved in teaching uh, first summer semester, uh, semester at the Fort Bergman Research Center. And three weeks into that semester, I got a call from Jim Brooks saying, Bill, Paul Harden has just resigned as president. They've asked me to uh, step into the president's office, and I'm going to Europe, uh, and you've got to come back. So I had to find someone to finish out my, uh, my uh, uh, course at Fort Bergwin and, and, and came back uh, uh, to run the uh, uh, provost's office. Uh, yes, the first thing that happened was uh, that uh, the 
Office of Admissions, the registrar, both reported to the provost's office. The Office of Financial Aid reported to uh, Office of Student Affairs, Vice President for Student Affairs. Uh, Willis Tate, who had taken, had come in as president after Paul resigned, uh, called me one day and said, how would you uh, suggest that we, we set this up? This is an awkward arrangement. And I wrote Willis a nice uh, long letter and explained to him that I thought all three of those operations ought to report to the provost's office. And Willis called me back and said, that's a great idea. Next thing I knew, he had contacted Barbara Reagan in, mm. in Europe asking her to take over <laughs> all, three, all three of those uh, offices, which made it a little awkward for uh, uh, several uh, years, but ultimately they did come back to the provost's uh, office. Mm. The other uh, uh, problem that uh, raised its ugly head at that time was that um, one of the women on campus had uh, written to the uh, EEOC in Washington uh, saying that uh, SMU was discriminating against women. It was a, uh, a very uh, poorly written letter and many of the allegations were simply not true but the chairman of the EEOC in Washington then filed suit against SMU and uh, we had to put together uh, volumes of material to show that we were not discriminating. I remember filling up a whole office with uh, uh, materials and the EEOC sent in a young man to begin to peruse these and after he'd been uh, perusing these for two weeks he, re he resigned <laughs> and that suit never amounted uh, uh, to anything. Uh, nothing ever came of it. We were never uh, chastised or anything of that sort. Do you remember any particular matters of interest in dealing with the deans in your stand in the provost office? Well, the deans were always an interesting group. Uh, and among the deans, from time to time, there was a uh, what I would refer to, who I would refer to as a character. Mm -hmm. One of these was Kermit Hunter, who was uh, dean of the Meadows School of the Arts. And uh, uh, Kermit confused issues for the deans from mm -hmm. time to time, but he also uh, kept us rolling in the aisles with, <laughs> with laughter because of some of the things that he, uh, uh, that he did. Uh, it was interesting working with the deans particularly at budget time, because uh, each of them had a, a very good agenda planned. I guess the, the two who were most crafty were Charlie Galvin and uh, Joe, Quillian. Joe Quillian. Joe Quillian, yeah. Joe, Joe was a master at disguising uh, uh, things in, in the budget, so we always had a good time. We uh, had a good relationship, I think, uh, with them. And uh, we, we got along. We had no real problems in this regard. Well, I remember a dinner downtown that I think <laughs> Jim Zumberg had for you. You were supposed to be retiring from the provost's office. And uh, the next morning, Jim <laughs> announced he was resigning yeah. to become president of USC. And you came bouncing back into the administration. That was an interesting time. Uh, Yes, they were, uh, uh, Jim Zumberg had this dinner for uh, uh, A.J. Thomas. A.J. was retiring as interim dean uh, of the School of, of Law. And I have a pewter platter suitably inscribed uh, thanking me for my service in administration. And going down in the elevator that night, I rode down with two of the vice presidents and they said, uh, Jim Zumberg has called a breakfast meeting tomorrow. Why do you think that is? And they didn't know. And the first thing I knew, the next afternoon, Jim Brooks called me and said that Zumberg had resigned, that he was moving into the president's office, and I had to come back as provost. So I came back as uh, uh, a provost and stayed in that position until, well, then uh, Don Shields was employed as president, and he insisted that I stay on until we find a new provost and appointed me chair of the committee to find a, a new provost and we ultimately brought in Hans Hillebrand uh, and Hans insisted that I 
stay right. on to help him out for uh, a semester or two, which I did. I finally did get back to the biology department. I think it was in probably 1984 <coughs> or 85. And uh, then in the spring of 86, I got a call from uh, Don Shields mm -hmm. asking me if I could come over to see him, which I did, and he said, I've just uh, had to do the hardest thing I've ever mm -hmm. done in my life, and that is uh, fire a provost. And I said, oh my God, you know, uh, what happened? Uh, well, he said, I just had to, uh, had to uh, send uh, Hans Hillebrand back to the faculty, mm -hmm. and would you serve as provost and, uh, until we get a new uh, a person in, in, in lined up, and I said, well, Don, uh, that'll take a long, no, 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 I'll have somebody in by September, <laughs> which I knew was not true, but I agreed to, to do that. That, that summer, Don became quite ill uh, with uh, uh, diabetes mm -hmm. and went to California for a couple of months mm -hmm. to uh, try and recuperate. Uh, toward the end of the summer, I had a call from Bob Hitch, who was the athletic director, telling me that there had been people from one of the television channels on campus uh, alleging that we were paying football players, and uh, but there was nothing to it. We were absolutely clean. I said, I, I'd better call uh, Don. She, oh, no, don't bother, don't bother the president. Uh, everything, we're clean, everything will come out all right. Well, Don got back to campus in September, and it wasn't long after that that it became very clear that uh, our athletic department was paying uh, football uh, players. And this completely uh, uh, affected Don, not only physically, but emotionally. And as you know, he, uh, he had, to, had to retire at that particular point. And uh, I was called down by Ed Cox, who was chairman of the board at that time. And I don't know if I wanted to be president of the university. And I said, uh, Ed, I'm already uh, uh, you know, 65 years old. I'm getting ready to retire. Well, he said, uh, would you agree to take it on until we find a, uh, a new president? And I agreed to do that, which was uh, not a good decision on my part because that next year was a, a very, very uh, a difficult uh, year with uh, all of the media uh, having people full time on, uh, on campus and reporting almost everything that, that I did or that anybody else uh, did and the, I think the thing that kept me sane was the tremendous uh, support that I got from the faculty and from the students and from what I now refer to as my team in, in Perkins administration, uh, Mary Jane Johnson and, and Donna Hancock in the president's office, Leon Bennett uh, who was the attorney for the university and Mark Scharaus who was assistant to the president. I think. Without those people, I would never have uh, uh, made it. There, was all, all, there were all sorts of pressures brought to bear from uh, alumni, from the uh, uh, Mustang uh, Association, wanting to immediately uh, continue with, with football at that point, although we'd been placed on, uh, we, we'd been given the death penalty for one year, and all of our scholarship players left but they wanted to have football the next year. And I said, you know, we can't do that. We can't just use walk-on players to go out with the semi-professionals from other schools. We'll, we'll have a lot of injuries and so on. And, and that was a very difficult decision and didn't go over very well with a lot of the uh, alumni. But as I say, I had tremendous support, I think, from the faculty and students, and, and uh, we weathered the, weathered the storm. Uh, well, I thought that uh, your stepping into that and Willis's stepping in after the Harden <laughs> fiasco were two of the greater crises. I very much admired uh, Leroy Howe's operation as president of the faculty senate yeah. and sympathized with Lonnie Cleaver, who was the athletic uh, right, representative, right. but never had much sense in detail what you were undergoing other than that you were Having brickbats thrown at well, you. Well, I could never step another. out of the office without either a camera or a microphone uh, stuck in my uh, 
stuck in my face. And as I say, there were pressures, telephone calls from uh, uh, alumni, some alumni wanting to uh, uh, return their uh, uh, degrees and, and so on so forth. Uh, and how calls. The, how were the trustees in the, the city? The trustees, uh, I would say at first the trustees were somewhat uh, uh, confused but very quickly came together and wanted to solve the problem and as a result, as you know, uh, we did get rid of the governing board which is sort of a, an executive committee for the for the board of trustees and there were several uh, heroes who stepped forth there. Bill Hutchison, for example, was I think one of the real heroes uh, uh, who uh, brought about uh, uh, the demise of the governing board and, and helped us get through this particular uh, crisis. Uh, I was going to say, uh, now I've forgotten, I've forgotten what I was going to say, so go ahead. Well, I can recall uh, some kind of church investigating group who I thought were rather high-handed in the, uh, some of their moralistic pronouncements in the situation. The, uh, the main body, administrative body of the Methodist Church in Nashville, Tennessee, mm -hmm was of course very interested in, in our, our situation here and particularly as a result of the so-called Bishop's mm -hmm. report, they became really upset with SMU and wanted to... Could you tell us a little bit about what the Bishop's report was? The Bishop's <laughs> report uh, said in essence that there had been a big cover-up not only of the fact that uh, we were paying football players, but the fact that Governor Clements had approved uh, that, uh, uh, that they go continue to pay football players and that the cover-up was that Bill Hutchison and several others of us, including myself, uh, knew this and, uh, uh, and uh, never, uh, never made it known. Uh, for myself, I simply have to say that shortly after I took over the presidency, I had a meeting with uh, with Ed Cox and and uh, two or three other trustees at that point, and the athletic director, who uh, athletic director saying that uh, Cox had approved the payments. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, Clements had approved payments. Uh, but Ed Cox said no, the governor would never do anything like that. And we had been told by Bob Hitch for a year that the program was completely clean, so I didn't believe uh, Bob Hitch. I never believed that Clements had had anything to do with it until he had, he, he announced uh, that next spring that he had known about it. Now, since then, I've, I've discovered a number of things. When Clements came out of the governor's office after his first term, Cox and Shields and other members of the trustees asked him to take on the chairmanship of the Board of Governors. And Clements asked them specifically at that time, do we have any problems, particularly mm -hmm. in athletics, no, no problems, no problems whatsoever. Mm -hmm. We're completely clean uh, and, and above board. Then Clements found out the truth that football players were being paid, not only being paid, or under contract, I mean, had contracts that said that the university would pay them. And uh, he probably did what he thought was best at that time and Maybe I would have done the same thing. I don't know, but he said, okay, we will fulfill these contracts, but we'll not pay any other football player. Uh, so that seems to be the truth of the, I think, I think Clements, uh, Clements was uh, really suckered into this whole situation and much to his credit, he never named one name and there were a lot of people who knew what was going on. He took, the, he took the full credit. The only one who admitted otherwise was Bobby Stewart. Hmm. Bobby, Bobby did admit that he, uh, he had known what was going on, but Clements took the brunt for everybody else. 
and in some ways he was the most vulnerable. He was, that's exactly figure. right. That's exactly right. He has, of course, been a a great contributor to the life of this university, and mm -hmm. with the money that he's given to renovate buildings and uh, to endow the uh, history department. And of course, we would not have our summer campus uh, at Fort Bergwin if it were not for Clements, because uh, Clements is responsible almost entirely for the uh, residential, mm -hmm. student residential area that we have out there. Plus, he still gives every summer a considerable amount of money for fellowships for students to attend Fort Bergwin. Mm -hmm. Uh, he had bought, uh, initially, he had bought land to add to the Fort Bergwin property. Uh, in about 1992, when I was the director out there, uh, Clements came around and said, now I will buy back what amounted to 130 acres uh, on which his house sits out there if you will take the money and use it as an endowment for Fort Bergwin. Well, I called in uh, uh, two uh, appraisers from the Taos area, and the figures that they came up with were quite different. One was $650,000, the other was $950,000. And uh, several of us got together uh, uh, and to decide what we ought to do in this regard. And we said, well, we'll just split it down the middle, and uh, Leon Bennett uh, took this uh, to the governor and the governor said, I'll give you $950,000, which he did. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that uh, has been, uh, uh, that money has really been very, very useful uh, for the program at Fort Bergwin because uh, there's always a lot of maintenance that needs to be done and, and the uh, interest off of his endowment now is, is, is making that uh, improvements possible, mm -hmm. making those improvements possible. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it might be helpful, Bill, to tell us a little more, bit more about the various programs at Fort Bergwin and their perhaps shifts over the years. Uh, <coughs> when SMU first became involved with Fort Bergwin, I will not go into all the details of how it became involved, but the, uh, the archaeology program at the uh, Pot Creek Pueblo, which is on university property, had been going on for several years. And then, I suppose about 1970 or 71, uh, Marshall Terry uh, began teaching a, a creative writing a course at uh, Fort Bergwin in the summer. My first visit to Fort Bergwin was in 1972. Uh, I'd just become associate dean in, in the School of Humanities and Sciences, and I thought, what a wonderful facility. This would be great for recruiting purposes and I spent, as you may remember, the next uh, year uh, advertising uh, three courses, science courses, for incoming freshmen out there. Well, it was a disaster. <coughs> I think we had 11 students. The uh, uh, student residences that were supposed to have been completed, the dining hall, which was supposed to have been completed, were not completed. So we had to put up uh, students in uh, less than satisfactory uh, uh, buildings uh, to live and and uh, uh, so that that did not work. I saw very quickly that uh, that was the wrong path to take. The next summer, 1974, was the really the first academic uh, summer at Fort Bergwin. Uh, uh, there were several courses that were taught, uh, uh, a couple of biology courses. Marsh Terry was teaching a a creative writing course. There was uh, an anthropology uh, a course being taught out there. Mm -hmm. Bill Pulte and his uh, Cherokee mm -hmm. uh, language uh, project. But since that time, it's become a full-fledged summer campus with, with courses in uh, uh, the sciences, primarily biology. Archaeology uh, has continued. Geology uh, continued for a while but dropped out very shortly because I think the uh, numbers of majors in the geology department dropped precipitously and there were really uh, too few students to, mm. to have that sort of course out there. But uh, there are now courses in the humanities and social sciences, the sciences, uh, in the arts, 
painting. Uh, there has been some uh, Shakespeare theater out there from uh, uh, time to time. Uh, Archaeology continues not only at the Pueblo. Next summer they will do actually uh, uh, a historical dig on the old, uh, in the old fort compound itself. There are a number of foundations there that are known but that have never been explored. And so uh, I think under the direction of Ron Wetherington next summer, the students are going to begin to explore one of the other old buildings in the Fort Compound itself. The courses out there are courses that really are taught better there than they would be on uh, campus. Uh, Taos is referred to as a tricultural area. I think that's a misnomer because they always leave out the French, the old French traders who are among the first people in there. But we make uh, our, our courses in uh, in uh, humanities and uh, social sciences and so on, take advantage or try to take advantage of those uh, uh, cultures. And of course, from the environmentalist standpoint, I could take my students when I was teaching there, I could take my students from semi-desert to uh, uh, above uh, Timberline in a matter of uh, five or six hours. So it's a tremendous opportunity from the standpoint of, of environment and, and uh, uh, biological sciences there. Unfortunately, the uh, Department of Biology now is, is uh, oriented in a completely different direction and there really is no one in biology except John Uvalocker, who uh, is, is really interested in or capable of teaching a course out there. So I'm hoping that maybe they'll find some, uh, maybe some people from other institutions who could come in and and take over that end of it. Bill, let me steer you back to another topic. Uh, you were president out interim when Ken Pye arrived, and uh, I'd kind of like to get a sense of your sense of Ken at that time, and uh, the transition, and anything else you might, might want to say. Presidents I've known. <laughs> Ray, uh, Ray Hunt's committee operated completely uh, in secret. No one knew whom they were interviewing, where they were going, uh, and so on. Uh, I, was not, I was not even kept informed. Didn't really care about being kept informed. There were no, enough other problems to take care of. I got a call from Ray Hunt one day saying, Bill, uh, we think we found a good man. He said, well, what do you think uh, people at SMU would, would have to say if we if we uh, nominated a Catholic for president. I said, I don't think any, anybody would think other of it, anything of it, except that uh, if he's a good man, we'd be delighted to uh, uh, have him. And as a matter of fact, I think that turned out to be the case with uh, objection, one or two objections from Methodist clergy uh, around the place. And when he suggested, uh, when he told me this, I thought I knew almost automatically uh, who it was going to be because Ken Pye had been on a visiting uh, committee, uh, accreditation committee for the law school a couple of years yeah. before. And uh, I knew where he was, I knew what he was doing, and uh, I said, is this Ken Pye? And, and Ray said, oh yeah, that's, that's who it is. And um, uh, I, was, I was very much, very much impressed by Ken when I got to know him, I, I, I think he was a person of very great integrity. Um, Ken was not a person who enjoyed socializing to any great extent, but uh, I think he was a very good person for the university at the time in, at which he came in. Um, I like Ken very much. I, I really didn't get to know him very well because I, I retired uh, shortly. Mm. Well, no, he came in 87. I retired in 89, mm. but I was back in the biology yeah. department mm. uh, because I, I swore I would never retire yeah. as an administrator. Yeah. I would retire as a faculty member. Yeah. But uh, I, did, I did not get to know Ken well, but uh, he did come uh, to Taos. Uh, we had dinner together. We had uh, cocktails at my house. Uh, he was very interested in, in, in Fort Bergwin. Uh, 
at the time, at that time, uh, the university was subsidizing Fort Bergwin to the tune of about one hundred eighty thousand dollars a year, and and Ken had said, you know, university cannot stand this, and he even thought about selling it. Uh, he thought about going into uh, cahoots with uh, Stanford University. As a matter of fact, uh, I got a call in Taos one day uh, from Ken saying, now. This is completely confidential, but there are going to be a couple of deans from Stanford University out there. I want you to show them around. I don't want anybody to know that they're there. Uh, and the first person we ran into was uh, Jim Judge, who was then director of Fort Bergwin. I introduced them as, as uh, friends from, uh, from California, and I think they were quite interested. But shortly after that, there was that big earthquake in California, which really damaged uh, the Stanford campus to a great extent, and they had to use any spare money they had to uh, repair, repair that damage out there. And then, you know, the former director would, well, it, it took wild horses to drag him to campus, and so Fort Bergwin and the program there was the best kept secret on this, on this campus, and when Jim, resigned and they asked me to, if I would take over. Uh, I said I'll do it for three years. I spent at least, uh, although I wanted to be in Taos, I spent at least six months out of every year back here on campus and the program director Nadine Pierce and I really uh, talked the program up, put out all sorts of advertising and I think that first summer we cut that deficit to about thirty thousand dollars, and ever since then the program has been in the black. It just it just takes work on on this campus to advertise the the program and get people to come out and teach in the program. But I think it's uh, uh, it's still in the black. And I think it's it's doing uh, it's doing very well. Well, I, 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 that's news to me. This in the black. I'm pleased. To hear. Yeah, yeah. It, it's operating completely in the black, without. And I, I hate to say this, but without much help now from the university, uh, I've been of the opinion ever since I was, became director out there that major problems like breaks in the electrical lines or breaks, main plumbing breaks and so on, ought to be taken care of by buildings and grounds here as they, as they are on campus. Uh, but no, that doesn't happen. Everything has to come out of the Fort Bergwin budget. And of course that budget relies almost entirely on, on, on tuition and, and room and board. So uh, the budget can, is fairly tight, but uh, uh, the, program is, the program is doing well. It's, uh, it's not costing the university anything. You ask me about my opinions of, of presidents. I thought that Ken Pye uh, a man of great integrity. I thought he did a good job. Uh, Humphrey Lee was president when Humphrey, he first came. No, uh, uh, Select, Dr. Selectman oh, nice. was president when I first came. I've, I've served in some capacity as either student or employee under every president except uh, presidents Hire and Bowes. Uh, Humphrey Lee was a was a very dear man. Uh, of course. The campus was small in those days. It was, it was sort of a family-type university, but Humphrey Lee uh, knew almost everybody's name. I would pass him on campus, and he would, uh, I'd been introduced to him, and he, he would call me by name. Uh, yeah, he was a, he was a very uh, uh, dear person indeed. And of course, Willis uh, uh, took over, and uh, the university made big strides with respect to building uh, at that particular uh, point in time. Uh, Jim Zumberg came on board, and uh, Jim Zumberg, uh, I, I think, uh, had, had as much class as anybody I've, I've ever known. But Jim, once again, was not a very gregarious person. He was uh, a bit standoffish. I was associate provost at that time, and I usually showed up in the office fairly early, 7.30, and oftentimes I'd look up and Jim would be standing in the door smoking his pipe. <laughs> And I'd say, come in, Jim, and he'd come in, we'd sit down, and, and we had a really uh, a very nice uh, a conversation. 
uh, we never became really close friends, but I think we had a good, mm -hmm. a good relationship. And then, of course, uh, after he left, uh, well, Jim Brooks took over as interim mm -hmm. uh, president and uh, served well for a year. And then, of course, Don Shields uh, came in. And uh, I guess I have to say I felt uh, rather sorry for, mm -hmm. for Don uh, uh, from the beginning. Don was really was really somewhat out of place mm -hmm. at, at the university and, and, and in Dallas, mm -hmm. I thought. Uh, uh, he came in, uh, Don, uh, as you remember, had a big ego, and the first thing he said was, to, in his first interview, I remember so clearly, I'm on the fast track, you know. <laughs> he kept saying in the fast, fast lane, track. yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'd never let him forget that. Uh, and uh, one time introduced him as the, what, what, uh, as the uh, well, president nobody knows because I don't think uh -huh. Many of the faculty really got to uh, to know Don uh, ever, and uh, Don was uh, Don was really hurt uh, by this by the football scandal. Uh, he just went all to pieces. How much do you think he knew about what was going on, Jim? I think he knew everything about what was going on. I hate to say that, but I, I believe he did. He was one of the people who uh, told Clemens everything's clean. Ed Cox told Clemens, everything's clean. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have to say, you know, that when it all came out, uh, Ed Cox never opened his mouth. He let mm -hmm. his Bill good friend Bill Clemens take the, take the whole brunt mm -hmm. of the thing. I think Don knew. I think that's one of the reasons yeah. it hit him so hard. Yeah. Well, I can't help contrast the Ed Cox who essentially shrank away and uh, curse on your house as being thickly in it, and yeah. poor Bill taking the public flack and then yeah. staying loyal. It's yeah, true. right. It's, it's amazing to me because, you know, they're very good friends, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Clemens entertains Cox mm -hmm. at his home in, in Taos mm -hmm. from time to time, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's very strange mm -hmm. to me now, uh, but that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I have to hand it to Clements for doing, doing finally what he did. Yeah. And, uh, I've come to, because he spends a, he and his wife spend a lot of time in Taos during the summer. Exception being this last summer because they're building a, they're building a new home here, uh, in uh, University Park, and they spent most of their. They're going to sell the big house on. They've already sold it. It sold yeah. for some enormous mm -hmm. price. And they're building a rather large house uh, of 8,000 square feet, a house to fit their furniture, I think Rita <laughs> says. And uh, uh, it should be finished within this next year, I, I gather there. Uh, I think Bill has just had a second hip operation, I think last month. Uh, well, how old is Bill? Well, Bill's got to be 84, I imagine. Fine, building a new house at 84. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> it's <the> spirit. <laughs> Well, of course, he was a great tennis player, he and Rita both, and uh, as a result, there are some beautiful tennis courts at Fort Bergwin. But after his first hip operation, uh, he pretty much let tennis go, but he and Rita still play golf at least every other day when they're in Taos, I, I imagine here too. Although Bill has been rather badly uh, uh, crippled with this other hip, so this should Hope this one takes yeah, care of it. Seems awful to have to go through it twice. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, I've come to uh, I've come to uh, uh, admire uh, Governor Clements. I think uh, he's been a real friend to this university. He's uh, sometimes a difficult man to get along with, but he he will listen. And if you have a viewpoint which differs from his, he will listen to you and he may not ultimately agree with you or maybe he will but at least he'll listen to you and uh, he's not completely set in his ways although he can be very opinionated on certain things uh, well, I remember one of my run-ins with him we were playing tennis out at the hotel I forgot the name of it in Taos and sagebrush previous year I'd, I'd gone out to Fort Bergwin and I thought I'd intimidated uh, 
Ron Wetherington, so I didn't go over there, and he jumped all over me. Not <laughs> going over there. <laughs> not going over to the archaeological. Fort, Fort Burgwood. Oh, right over to Fort Burgwood. Yeah. 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 Well. It meant a lot to him. And it that. does. It still means a lot to him. He's concerned that the university, at least in his opinion, has sort of lost interest in the fort and is not doing more than it is doing for for the fort and so on. Yeah. So. But, uh, you know, he has, he now has uh, three houses out there. His original house that he built, at the same time Bill Haroy built a house just next to his. Uh, and then uh, Clements built a guest house, which is very nice. And then Haroy decided he didn't want to be out there anymore, so he left his house to Fort Bergwin. I was director and I thought this is going to be a white elephant for Fort Bergwin. You know, we can't... We can't, uh, it's not right adjacent mm -hmm. to the fort. It's, uh, it's, you have to go two or three miles by road to get to it, and it's going to need maintenance. And, and, and so I, I had uh, the university deeded mm -hmm. back over to Clements. Mm -hmm. So Clements now has the three houses mm -hmm. and the property, which I am sure SMU will get back no. when the governor passes on. Yeah. So. <laughs> It would be nice if we could find a use for it, kind of like being willed a wonderful Degaria place That's at the lake. Exactly and right. Find anything to exactly do it. right. The university has, uh, whether it knows it or not, has a wonderful situation out there. If they ever wanted to sell the place, the mm -hmm. property is, is prime property. Uh, and the water rights, mm -hmm. my gosh, which are very important in New Mexico, the water rights would. would re would, would, would provide a fortune for the university. Uh, the university could actually retain the water rights if it wanted to and, and then lease the water rights to whoever took over that area out there. So the university uh, ha has a very good thing in, in, the, uh, in the property that they have there. They, the university itself owns 300 acres still. It did own 423 and then Clements bought back 123 acres which the Ford, I'm sure, will get back one of these yeah. days. Well, Bill, in conclusion, are there any particular summary shots you'd like to make in terms of your sense of SMU from 1937 or earlier? To well, you know, Jim, uh, I thought I got a good background education at SMU. I wish, and this is my fault, I wish it had been broader than it was. But when I went to graduate school, I really never had to take a back seat to anybody. I had a, I had a fine basic education here. And I've always felt that I owe the university a great deal because, you know, I, I probably would have gone to college ultimately, but I uh, wouldn't have gone at that time unless they had provided me with the emergency uh, a scholarship that they provided me with. And then, of course, the National Youth Administration came along during that time. And, and so uh, we worked as lab assistants for 35 cents an hour uh, and got good experience that way. And then my last two years, I found they had a scholarship, a half scholarship, for offspring of World War I veterans, oh. which my father was. So I had a half scholarship during those times. The other uh, major thing I, I took from SMU uh, was my wife. We met in the biology lab at SMU, and uh, after several years, I finally persuaded her to marry me. And, and uh, let's see, we'll be celebrating our uh, 58th anniversary here the day after Thanksgiving. So we've been with each other for a long time. We were both lab assistants in biology there. She stayed on and got a master's degree and went, went to work for the, what was then the State Game Fish and Oyster Commission in Austin. So I used to have to travel to uh, to uh, Austin yeah. to uh, uh, continue my courtship, yeah. and ultimately per persuaded her to yeah. marry me and come back to Dallas. And I think two weeks after we yeah. married, I got orders to report right. for <laughs> report for service. Uh, but uh, it all went well. No, I I, uh, I thought at the time I came here that it was a good university, I think, at the present time. It is uh, probably, better than a, uh, probably better than a good 
uh, university. I think uh, students who come here and who take advantage of the opportunities that are available to them now, more so than when I was here, the opportunities that are available to them now uh, uh, should have a, a tremendous uh, uh, background and uh, a background not only in so far as employment is concerned, but a background uh, in uh, uh, in living, so to speak, with you know with the courses they're now re required to take. Some of which I wish I'd been required to uh, take when I was here. I regret that I didn't get more into the humanities, for example, into the arts. Uh, well, with Pat. <laughs> More recent phases, I think you've probably made up for. The yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I, I give credit to her in that regard because we, uh, she has really stimulated my interest both in uh, visual arts and in in music. And of course, my my uh, youngest daughter, being a cellist, that also has gotten me interested in in in, in music to some extent. All my daughters were musicians. One of them majored in music at Stanford, as a matter of fact. Uh, my two older daughters uh, were, were very excellent uh, pianists. Mm -hmm. My middle daughter still is. My older daughter uh, developed uh, multiple sclerosis mm -hmm. uh, oh, about six or seven years ago, and her hands and fingers mm -hmm. are a little bit impaired. She's, mm -hmm. you know, she's, uh, she's pretty lucky. She's been on a plateau and she doesn't have serious seizures, but she has lost the ability to really use her fingers as she would like to, to play the piano and so on. But uh, everything's going well, I, you know. I, I've enjoyed 80 years of uh, good health. I can't really complain, you know. Things happen that make me, from time to time, know that I'm mortal. <laughs> but. No, I can't complain. I've had a good life, and I credit uh, a great deal of it to uh, my experiences here at SMU. Well, thanks very much, Bill. I think Jim, it's been a real privilege uh, got some visiting sense with of one you. man's yeah. sense of SMU for yeah, well, a long period, critical time. Well, I hope that I repaid a little bit of my debt uh, to the university. I hope that I have, anyway.